Hi everyone, in our last video, we worked on introducing the AM0 and AM1.5G spectra. Those are the fundamentals in order to understand what kinds of solar spectra are incident onto our solar devices and is an intro to a very important concept in the solar cell world, which is called the detailed balance limit. So today I'll be giving a tutorial on this very important concept. And so the graph here shown is the detail balance limit that many uh, researchers talk about when they work with solar cells. And so we're going to talk about what this graph means and why it's important. And so many of the questions that solar cell researchers ask are, what is the highest possible efficiency of a single junction solar cell? If we have a solar cell, what is the thermodynamic limit that we can achieve with this device? So it turns out for a single junction solar cell, the highest efficiency is about 34%, I believe around 33.6%. And so how are people able to derive this? And it's actually from this very known graph uh, with the citation shown on this slide. And I graphed uh, the single junction detail balance limit shown here, where you can see that for the AM 1.5G spectra, the highest efficiency is around 34% at a band gap of around 1.34 EV. And for AM0, it's shifted a little bit to the left for the optimal efficiency and where that band gap occurs. So the question is, now that we know this fundamental limit, which is important to understand since uh, we want to know what's the highest efficiency that we can even achieve, and also what kinds of losses go into this efficiency? Why is the efficiency not, for example, 100%? Why is it at only 34%? And so we need to understand these losses and why the limiting efficiency is at this number in order to understand how we can improve our device and what kind of losses we need to reduce that is contributing most to reducing our efficiency. And so to understand this graph, first we need to review a bit about what solar irradiance is, what we reviewed from the AM0 and AM1.5G spectra in the previous video. Then we'll go over um, specifics about the single junction device of your solar cell, what kinds of equations are needed in order to understand what can we do with the sunlight and convert it to current electricity, what kinds of equations uh, explain that process. And then we'll go over the detailed balance limit, how to get this graph from the equations as well as the solar irradiance. So first we need to know what the model assumes. The detailed balance model assumes that every photon absorbed generates an electron hole pair and only has radio recombination processes. So what that means is if we look at the conduction band and valence band of an example band structure, and we have incident illumination from say our AM1.5G spectra, we can then separate an electron hole pair where we excite an electron to the conduction band, it relaxes, recombines with a hole in the valence band, and it emits a photon or also known as photoluminescence. And so with this process, this is called radio recombination as an electron is excited and then uh, recombines with a hole in the valence band to emit a photon. Uh, we don't have any non-radio recombination, meaning that we don't have the electron relax and recombine with a defect in a defect state or um, have OJ recombination, which would then lead to not having this specific process that is known as radio recombination. And so, um, with these assumptions, we also have a third assumption, which is that we assume there's stepwise absorption in this model in that for um, any kind of material, we have a band gap as shown, as shown as E is equal to EG. And so we have a photon that's incident onto our material. If the photon has energy that is equal or greater to our band gap, then we assume that it's absorbed. If it's less than this energy, then it's not absorbed. So this is a stepwise absorption that we um, assume in our model in order to not assume a specific real material, but instead assume different band gaps and assume a stepwise absorption to simplify the model a bit. Uh, but keep in mind that real materials will have more of a curved kind of absorption versus step absorption. And so with these models, now we can go uh, and review a little bit about the solar irradiance, which is important because that is what is going to be used to convert into electricity. We need to have sunlight um, to then excite our electrons and then generate a current for our solar cell. And so a quick review for the solar irradiance as shown on the left, 
you can assume the sun is like a black body at 6,000 Kelvin, as shown here, and it emits a certain power density that is uh, given by Planck's radiation law. So you, we can use that equation in our detail balance model, or we can also use what the A1.5G spectra is, where this is experimentally measured data from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where it accounts for absorption from atmospheric gases, as well as if you're in space, you can use the AM0 spectra. So uh, these are our incident sunlight that's going to be on our solar cell. And so now we can go a little bit more in depth about what equations are important in our solar cell for our model. So first we need to start off with what is called deriving the ideal diet equation, which is uh, calculating an equation for how much current you're getting out of your solar cell. And so first for total current that you're getting out of your solar cell, you need to account for two things, which is the number of absorbed photons minus the number of emitted photons times Q in order to get current. And so for the absorbed photons, we need to account for two things, the AM1.5G spectra, which is uh, also known as, which also can be used with your, as your black body of the sun. So you can use either AM1.5G or BB sun. And then you also have surrounding kind of black body where in the dark, if you have no sunlight, there's still thermal uh, excitation from your surroundings in your solar cell, and which can excite electrons. And so that also needs to be taken into, into account, but it's uh, very small compared to, say, your A1.5G spectra that uh, your, the incident sunlight that is exciting your electrons. And then for the emitted photons, because this is a semiconductor, you have radio recombination, as shown in the previous slide, where the electron recombines with a hole and emits photons. So you need to account for those photons that are being emitted from your solar cell, which is represented as this equation, where you have the black body of your solar cell, since it's emitting photons, and then you have this um, N e times NH, which is your, your density of your electrons, times the carrier concentration of your holes divided by Ni squared times your BB cell, which is your black body. And you can notice that for all the integrals, we have the integral for, go from the band gap to infinity because this you're either absorbing or emitting in the range of your band gap or above for the energies. If you have energies that are less than your band gap, you're not absorbing that and you're also not emitting those photon energies. And then you have, for the AM15G spectra, when you times that by Q, you have J illumination, which is your current density. J naught is your dark current density, which is coming from your surroundings, as well as you can represent the emitted photons with the dark current term as well, times the NEH over Ni squared. We can simplify the right two terms and combine them as shown here, and then we can re-express the any nh over ni squared as a exponential with a voltage term and then with this voltage term now we can then simplify to get our ideal diode equation with a total current equal to negative j naught which is your dark current times an exponential term plus j illumination so this is a very important equation for solar cells because it explains and describes what happens as you vary voltage and your corresponding total current of a single junction solar cell. And then your J illumination is coming from your incident illumination that you are putting onto your single junction solar cell. And so this is the total current that we're able to generate. So with this equation, uh, knowing the solar irradiance and our band gap of any kind of material, we can then use the ideal diode equation, calculate the total current that we're getting from the solar cell at a certain voltage. And then we can use these equations and the A1.5G spectra to then output the detailed balance limit graph, which calculates the power conversion efficiency, uh, also known as the power out over the power in. And then um, graph this graph with varying band gap. And then identify what our limiting efficiency is. So to understand how we can code this, I created a pseudocode coding the detailed bounce limit, where we first start off with specifying our band gap energy range, which could be, for example, 0 to 3 EV, and then um, define the constants 
For example, Planck's constant, which is going to be used for our black body equation, as well as load the AM15G spectra data. Initiate the current density and power matrices. Start a for loop that will use our band gap energy range that we specified. Determine what incident photon energies are absorbed in our solar cell. Calculate the dark current. Calculate the J illumination from our A1.5G spectra. Store the J0 and J illumination. Start a second for loop, which will, based on what band gap you're varying upon, for each band gap, we know what the maximum voltage is and the range at which we can vary our voltage for our solar cell. Then we know from our ideal diode equation that we can calculate the total current as well as J illumination coming from the A1.5G spectra where we calculated in the uh, code right before. We calculate the max power point or MPP for each band gap energy in order to calculate what's the maximum power that we can get from a solar cell at a certain band gap and what voltage that occurs at. Calculate the total power in, which is the uh, A1.5G spectra that what that power would be uh, over those all those wavelengths of energy and then calculate the efficiency based on the power out which is your max power point divided by your power in which is what we calculated from the A1.5G spectra graph this and the results will look like this so as you can see uh, the A1.5G spectra has a limiting efficiency at around 33.6% at 1.34 eV, while the AM0 has a lower power conversion efficiency at a slightly lower band gap. And so this shows not only the highest efficiency, but also the limiting efficiency for each band gap energy that you can vary from 0 to 3 eV. This is important because for single junction solar cells, now we can know based on, say, a specific material, for example, if it was at uh, if it was at 1 eV, then we know the limiting efficiency would be around 32% uh, for AM1.5G spectra. And so we know what AIM there is in terms of what limit that we can achieve if we assume no losses. And if there are losses, then we can know from our calculations what is that specific loss, how can we work to reduce it in order to get closer to the limiting efficiency. And so this is very important for not only device design, but also understanding what is actually going on within your solar device. We need to understand why this is our limiting efficiency and how we can not only improve our device performance, but also understand the science behind what is going on in the care dynamics and the semiconductor physics. And so now I want to go a little bit in depth about where the assumptions break down for real materials from our model. And so when I mentioned before about the stepwise absorption, materials in real life actually don't have a stepwise ab absorption as shown here, where I have a 2D material called transition metal dichalcogenides. At the monolayer level, they have a direct band gap. And as shown on the right, they have absorbance that is not stepwise. In fact, it has a lot of bumps that vary in as you vary the photon energy. And so this is an example of how real materials deviate from that assumption of stepwise absorption. We can also look at that assumption of complete radiative recombination that is actually not completely true in terms of real materials because there is non-radiative losses that occur in real materials. For example, as shown on the left, we can see a bar chart of all the losses that can reduce your open circuit voltage, your VOC, including non-radiative loss. And what non radiative loss means is that instead of having that rate of recombination where you have the electron recombine with the hole as shown on the right and then emit a photon, also known as photoluminescence, you might have your electrons, say, recombine with a hole in a defect state or have OG recombination, which then leads to having a different recombination process that's not radiative. Because of this, this reduces your open circuit voltage as shown in the equation here, where you can, you can correlate the high rate of efficiency with quantum yield, photoluminescence quantum yield, or PLQI. And if your PLQI is less than one, meaning that you have some non of losses, that means this second term here becomes a negative term, which then means that you're reducing your VOC. However, if you have a PLQI of one, meaning complete rate of efficiency, so 100% uh, correlated, then that means your log term becomes zero, so you only have radio recombination that is occurring, 
which then means your VOC uh, can be maximized by having minimal or zero non-rated of loss. And so these kinds of assumptions that we had in our detailed balance model uh, doesn't account for these real material uh, properties that happen in solar cells. And so that's why it's also very important to understand the assumptions of the model, but also what losses are contributing to why we're not actually seeing a limiting efficiency of 33.6% at 1.34 EV in our uh, solar cells in the market. Like there are certain restrictions that are difficult to overcome that need further research and design to continue um, improving. And then another part is then the question of, can we actually maximize our quantum yield, our PLQI, so that we can minimize these down rate of losses and um, increase our VOC and therefore the efficiency of our solar cell? And the answer to that recently has been, yes, we can improve the PLQI. For example, in these two materials, we can achieve near unity quantum yields by uh, chemically treating um, as shown in this study. And so my next video, I plan to explain what PLQI is um, how different kinds of carrier dynamics occur and impact not only your PLQI, but also the uh, how they're interesting in different kinds of materials, such as 2D materials. And these carriers include excitons, trions, and bi-excitons, which are very interesting, especially in 2D materials, such as TMDCs. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment, be in the comment down below. And uh, please consider subscribing. And I look forward to sharing more about science and semiconductor physics.